Hello, I am Jolinda LeClaire, Director of Drug Prevention Policy for Vermont. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, which Governor Phil Scott established by executive order in January 2017. Since then, the Council has focused on its mission to improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges through prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. This crisis touches everyone in our state. Many Vermonters have family members and loved ones who have become addicted after receiving opioid prescriptions for pain. Others were exposed to opioids and other drugs through friends, dealers, and traffickers. Regardless of how they were exposed, we know we have among us many who now have the chronic, isolating, and too often deadly disease of addiction. We are making progress. Treatment is available across the state through Vermont's nationally known hub and spoke system of treatment. Recovery centers in our communities are providing effective wraparound support to help people achieve long-term recovery. Many communities are building prevention coalitions to provide our children and families the tools they need to be resilient in the face of life's challenges and traumas. Vermont law enforcement has steadily worked to increase community safety and to decrease the supply of illegal drugs. They also work hard to support prevention strategies that will reduce the demand for opioids. There is more we can do and must do to turn the curve on Vermont's opioid challenges. Drug prevention education is a top priority for schools and communities. Increasing intervention opportunities in emergency rooms and other places will help more people enter treatment and recovery. Individuals and families in recovery need support to obtain jobs and rebuild their lives, and support for harm reduction through safe and appropriate use and disposal of drugs and syringes will increase safety in homes and communities. Something we all can do to take every opportunity to raise awareness and reduce stigma by talking about addiction. To highlight the science of addiction, as well as the cultural, social, and economic challenges associated with addiction, the producers and hosts of Vermont Cable Access and the Opioid Coordination Council have created an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis, Working Together to Create a More Resilient Community. The fifth in the series is about enforcement. In this segment, host Pat McDonald focuses on the Opioid Coordination Council's strategies to reduce the supply of and demand for opioids and other drugs in Vermont through law enforcement efforts. This includes roadside drug driving tests, drug treatment courts, investigations, prosecution, and corrections. Thank you, Julinda, for your introduction. And I'd like now to introduce our guest for this evening is Commissioner Tom Anderson. Commissioner, welcome. Your first time on the show. And a repeat guest, uh, Chief Tony Faco, City of Montpelier. Nice to see you here. Thank, Thank you. you. for having me. This is a very important topic, as Jolinda talked about. And if you'll remember, um, Governor Shumlin spent his entire State of the State in 2014 talking about the heroin and prescription opioid abuse in Vermont. And I was one of many who was saying, what is he doing? I had no idea that we had the problem we have. Uh, and I was really surprised. I just uh, told the chief, I actually wrote a note and said, thank you for doing that, because I was completely clueless. And then when Governor Scott took over, one of the first things he did was create an opioid uh, coordination council. And uh, Commissioner, you are on the opioid as the co- I am the co-chair co of the opioid coordination council. And yeah. that was actually yeah, the first thing that Governor Scott did out of the yeah, box. That's so, great. Could you talk uh, a little bit about that? Absolutely. The so it's, it's, it's 22 members strong. And it cuts across a wide swath of uh, Vermonters, from law enforcement to uh, treatment providers to health department individuals to community act, uh, active members to recovery coaches. Uh, and what we're really trying to do with the Opioid Coordination Council is look at this holistically and come up with some recommendations, which we've done, uh, to move forward in the areas of treatment, prevention, recovery, 
and uh, law enforcement. That's great. Could you talk specifically, since this show is about law enforcement, um, do you recall all the recommendations or some of them that, uh, that focus on law enforcement? Yeah, and I've told people before, that, you know, law enforcement to me has, has sort of the, the easy part of this equation. Right. Um, as difficult as it is, we have sort of the easy part of this equation. So the recommendations that the uh, Opioid Coordination Council came out with with respect to the um, law enforcement was, number one, that we have a better uh, roadside testing for drug driving. That is a real hole in right. Vermont's law enforcement uh, area. So that was one that the Opioid Coordination Council supported, and that would be oral fluid uh, testing. The second was to sort of increase law enforcement resources in the area of drug enforcement in sort of a very narrow uh, band. And, you know, where we miss some investigations are those cases that are sort of locally driven, and they're not quite big enough. The dealers are not quite big enough to hit the radar screen of the Vermont Drug Task Force, uh, and, but they're more than kind of the local PDs can handle. So that was an area we really tried to focus mm. on to try to get additional resources um, in, in that area. And then finally, we also, we also were looking at... Um, Increasing the number of drug recognition experts, and again, oh, right. that goes back toward that goes back to uh, you know roadway safety with respect to people that are driving impaired by any number of drugs, whether opioids or marijuana or any other type of mind altering mind altering drug. And, and for those that don't know, a drug recognition expert is exactly that: it's an expert. They've been specially trained to detect uh, when somebody's operating a motor vehicle. Now, there's not the that influence. many of them that have been trained so far. Um, I don't know why I thought 40. Is that right? I'm not sure what the number is, is right now, but we have 45? made we, we've, we've done pretty well in that. Yeah, I mean, we've we've got classes that have kind of pushed through um, each year, and you know, I think we're in pretty good shape oh, now good. with with the REs. Good. Um, and you know, what we're trying to do is reduce the the time it takes to get a DRE out to the scene. Right. But but again, that is again that is somebody's opinion. Yeah. It's an expert opinion that I think this person is uh, under the influence of some some type of drug. Mm -hmm. Which then, you know, if we had the oral fluid roadside oral fluid swab testing, would confirm their, their observations with a test that would say uh, that person has whatever the screening drugs are right. that they're looking for. Well, now for. that you brought that up, they they had a bill to authorize the uh, oral fluids, but it died in the Senate uh, because they were worried about civil rights because it's it's um, taking your bodily fluids um, and they. They were so it died, I think, in the Senate. It was. Uh, it, it did die. It's yeah. been passed now twice in the House. Yeah. It's been killed twice now in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Huh. Um, and so I think the uh, the idea of, uh, you know, some of the arguments they use against it are it's collection of DNA when right. the, when that's not accurate because the statute specifically precludes uh, the collection for that purpose. Uh, the the head of the lab, Trish, Dr. Conti, testified that that would be contrary to their protocols and and the protocols required by the FBI, um, and. You know, the, the, the idea that, you know, right now we are permitted to take blood in a drug driving test. And the idea that taking blood is somehow less intrusive oh, than taking someone's saliva. I didn't saliva, even know that. Uh, that, it, you know, taking someone's saliva is, uh, yeah. is a mistake. It's, it's far less intrusive than taking someone's blood. Right. Um, and, you know, the science behind it, the House took significant testimony on the science behind the oral fluid swab testing. Um, the science is good. And the actual test of it would be a test we've been conducting at the lab for the last 20 years huh. on uh, bodily fluid, whether it's blood or other type of, of bodily fluid. Well, and I'm so, sure the Senate heard the same testimony as the House. Uh, well, they're, if they didn't, it was available to them. Yep. And I know that a number of people testified in, in Senate Judiciary about yeah. exactly about that. I know Dr. Conti did also. So right there. there's a lot of misinformation about what oral fluid uh, does and what it doesn't do right. and what it provides and what it doesn't provide. You know, my bottom line is it, it provides another piece of evidence exactly. to prosecutors and to juries right. um, on whether a person is impaired by drugs or not. And right. to me, from a public policy standpoint, more evidence is better than less evidence. If we, we arm prosecutors and juries with as much evidence as we can, right. that that's a good thing. Right. Can I ask you, when can they take blood? So blood can be taken if, if, uh, new if, thing. if, if they... <laughs> Again, it's it's you know driving is a privilege, so right. it's 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 you, you have implied consent laws. So, blood is normally taken now if someone consents to it. Um, if we if for example, it might be someone that's driving impaired, they, they're showing all the signs of impairment. Right. A DRA indicates that they think they're under the influence. Now we could ask the person to provide a blood sample, and they can decline or they could they can agree right. to it. Okay. Now it's often taken in situations where we have a serious accident. Uh, serious bodily injury has been caused during an accident, mm -hmm. or there's been a fatality. 
Um, so, and in those situations, now the difference between that is we have to get a warrant for blood. Oh, I see. So oh, right. you, you would also, oh, so and that is by really Supreme Court, uh, right. U.S. Supreme Court decision. Right. That, you know, it's so intrusive for yeah. Fourth Amendment purposes that it requires a warrant. Now, yeah. once you go down the path of having to get a warrant, it can take a long time. You know, you've got to find, you have to have a, an affidavit prepared. You have to have a, a judge found, located, right. the warrant then provided. If, it's, if there's probable cause, and then you have to take the person to the hospital right. and have the blood, blood drawn. Right. And frankly, what we're seeing now is some hospitals simply won't do it. Oh, really? So, yeah. So we've had some situations where hospitals, even with a warrant, simply won't do it. So again, you know, blood is a very ineffective way to be testing someone for right. uh, driving while impaired with drugs. And this just, um, the tests just say you're, you've taken drugs. It doesn't say you're impaired, which is... We haven't gotten there yet. Like with uh, alcohol, is there's a number, and if you go over that number, you're considered impaired. With with um, opioids and other things, it's it only that you've consumed. Correct. So right? I mean, the way I've, I try to explain is like people try to think of it in this mentality like alcohol. It's got to be a number, and if I don't have a number, right. it's no good. And it really that, that's the wrong way to think about it. Um, now, some states have, have adopted that a, a certain level, and that's it's a presumptive level. There's not a lot of good science behind that. Right. So. You know, what we were trying to adopt was simply, this is just another piece of evidence. Okay. It doesn't, uh, that, that the jury can consider and should be able to consider in determining whether that person was driving under the influence of some impairing drug or not. Because right. right. that's what the law, that's right. what the law prohibits, that you're driving right. uh, impaired right. by a drug or alcohol right. or a combination of those two things. Okay, so uh, before I turn over to the chief, could you give us this 10,000 foot view of the opioid crisis? You, I don't know if you have statistics with you, but... You gave us statistics at a meeting I was at the other night that just I, I me. tried. I to, mean, it was amazing. I, I tried to cull those down. So, <laughs> just um, staggering. You know, from a, just to, to give you an idea, from a national level, in 2016, there were uh, over 64,000 Americans died from a drug overdose. And uh, about two-thirds of those were from opioids. So that's about 175 people each day that die in the United States from a drug, from a drug overdose, wow. uh, two-thirds of those, those from op opioids. So to give it a, put it in perspective, which I always like to do, is that, that is each year we lose more people to an opioid overdose than we lost in the entire Vietnam War. The Americans killed during the entire Vietnam War. Wow. So it, it does, I think to me that brought home the, you know, yep. how, how extensive this is, and that's every year. Yep. Um, I, I would say if we had 175 people dying of Ebola every day, yeah. uh, there'd be, a, there'd be a different response <laughs> right. than, uh, yeah. than, than we have right now. So that's at the national level. At the, Vermont, at, at the state level, 107 people died in 2017 from opioid overdoses. Um, and that's been a steady increase really from since 2010. Uh, we hope we've bent the curve on that. There was about 106 in 2016. But that's up from about 41 deaths in 2010. So it's been a, it's been a steady increase. Okay. Um, right now, the estimate is about 15 to 20,000 Vermonters are addicted to opioids. Whoa. And that uh, Vermont, uh, this is not something we want to, like, uh, it's not a claim to fame, but we are, uh, is one of the top five states for heroin use as a percentage of its adult population. Oh, we're um, always in the top five or ten on everything, good or bad. <laughs> so it's not good. Yeah, so I wish I could tell you we've turned the corner yeah. on this. I can't. Um, I'm hopeful that we're doing some things now that will turn the corner right. on it. But, um, you know, right now I, I, I can't say that we have. You know, it's, it's oh. really this opioid epidemic has been a cancer on the state. Yes, this is terrible. Yeah. And I, I went to the opioid recognition <coughs> awareness day and I, and I heard you speak there and you were saying you just, I, you don't know, five years, ten years? There's no answer yet, yeah, but and we're working hard at it. I know you're going to talk a little bit later about the prescription opioids, but that right. really is the uh, root cause of right, this problem, right. the overprescribing of opioids right. over the last, you know, it's gotten better, but over well, the, 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 for, a num the, for any number the, of years. Well, the pharmaceutical companies said it was safe, right? Well, they did, and, the, and uh, you know, I... Maybe I, not. And, but they, they all had to be prescribed. Yeah. That they had to, a doctor had to prescribe right. those pills, right. and the doctors don't like to hear that, but... It was the overprescribing of opioids, and I think that's that was the conclusion of the president's commission on uh, 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 that he set forth on the opioid. But it was the overprescribing of these drugs for an awful long well, period. Well, you know, of time. my thing is, and uh, when you go to the doctor, no matter when you go, they say from zero to ten, what where's the pain? Which which means to me, I could, <clears throat> why can't I be at zero? So as a client, as a customer, I'm expecting zero is a norm. So get me to zero. Right. I mean, otherwise, why are you asking me zero to ten? 
Uh, that's a, I, I think that discussion started <coughs> a few years ago when all of this came about. Yeah, and I think I think, I think the, the president's used to zero. yeah the president's commission was um, you know critical of that of that being adopted. I think by the aim is like the fifth vital sign, uh, which is a, which is the only vital sign that's subjective. Yeah, all right. other vital signs sure. are objective tests: blood right. pressure, heart rate. What's painful to me may not exactly. Be to I you. might my four might be yeah. your eight. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree to that. So anyway, Chief, you are here at the local level in Montpelier, and you see the streets and the people. Um, what do you see here in, in Montpelier, and, and with your, when you meet with the other chiefs, what are they seeing? Um, I think the most profound uh, change that we've all experienced is our defining our jobs. I mean, if you were to ask me oh, 10 years ago, five years ago, or is it going to be standard that all police officers are going to be carrying a lock zone? Yeah. Uh, uh, to um, really um, the and, and changing the lens from you know the very serious crime problem mm -hmm. that, that the drug trade cr has cre creates and it's still there, but but what is our role in the overall umbrella of this is a health crisis? Right. So at the local level, um, on the positive side, uh, a couple of things. One. It's really brought us closer um, as far as agencies at all levels. Um, Montpelier has, we've had a lot of law enforcement and health related success in the last several years and it's because of really strong partnerships with Barry City, uh, mm -hmm. especially with the Vermont State Police, Drug Task Force in particular, and our federal partners, uh, ATF, FBI, DEA, and the coordination now that you see between the state's attorney, the Attorney General's office, and the United States Attorney's office, um, can really make, you know, when, when, when done right, um, can really make a difference in a local community. And on a positive, another positive note is on a small scale, we can sometimes see more quickly the effectiveness of our strategies. Um, and, I, and it's not just w any one thing that we're doing, um, but certainly the um, virtually all of our robberies and burglaries that we've solved uh, in the last several years. Uh, we were able to relate to, in some form wow. or other, there's a nexus to, our, to, uh, to addiction wow. or trafficking. And the, um, <clears throat> so one of the things as far as the, the kind of the mindset changing for law enforcement is where can we help, become, help facilitate um, the link between, uh, you know, the addicted uh, communi uh, community and the individual we come in contact with to help. And, and, th and we'll talk about that later with Project Safe Catch right. and some other other things that um, are listed, some of the national best practices and things that we're, right. uh, and I know Rutland's about ready to kick off. We've already just barely started doing it. Um, and we, so we've seen some, some significant reduction in robbery and burglary, uh, in particular um, for 2017. It's also the first year in several years we didn't have an overdose fatality. Yep. Um, unfortunately, we've already had one uh, for this year. Huh. So that, um, so, but it's, it's, that part is sporadic, but I, I look at the overall crime statistics there. And, uh, but the job has really changed, yeah. and the, the so partnerships are stronger. So how do you train stronger. for that? I mean, because I, I heard Chief po Pozo from Burlington. Del Pozo. Del Pozo. Del Pozo. Yeah. He said this was, well, even with all of his amazing background, he said this was fairly new to him. <clears throat> it's not, it's very complicated, and he's had to really, he has had to be trained, and so has all of his officers to know what they're looking for, mm -hmm. um, what they're dealing with. And um, I read a, an article where, what you said, um, I say Narcan, what? Well, Narcan or Naloxone. Naloxone. Right. Formally known. When they come, when you use that, they come out of it and they're, they're could be violent. They can, and yeah. So you've got to, you've got to really prepare. What kind of training's available for your folks and for state police? Sure, um, we've all had a, um, a, you know, we had our training uh, when we adopted using uh, Naloxone in 2015. Yeah. It was after the Vermont State Police had already started, uh, had already oh, implemented oh. it. Um, so I think we were probably like the, within the, you know, the top three departments that started using yeah. it back then. And, and Dr. Chris Laconis was, um, came in and, uh, um, and I had some pushback from a few folks in my department saying, you know, hey Good chief, one. we're not medics, you know, right. and, you know, and um, even though we do all the other first aid piece, but after we had the training, um, you know, with Dr. Laconis, we learned it was every, even those officers were totally engaged. Right. And wow, it made a big difference. Because you've got to do something you know. right away for these, uh, for these yeah. people. Yeah, well, it's also for the officer safety. Yeah. Um, because we're in contact, we're doing searches. Um, yeah. You know, a canine could be searching a vehicle, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, 
open up a package inadvertently uh, and, yeah, and right. it's in the Power. air. Uh, there's yeah. been multiple cases from New England of police officers, tactical teams that have had exposure to fentanyl yeah. that have had to um, be treated. Uh, mostly precautionary, but uh, it's certainly any any anything that we anticipate uh, that we're going to be in contact with narcotics. Right. It has, it's in our policy. They need, we need to have naloxone available to us. It, 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 yeah. it has changed. I mean, the fentanyl has. I mean, it, it, it can be absorbed through the skin, and oh. there are any number and that's of powder or it, oil. It's, the it's a powder. 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 It's powder, but it is extremely dangerous and can be extremely dangerous to police officers when they oh, go wow. in. Um, you know, to, to do a search. It has altered the way we do field testing for um, uh, heroin and, and other mm. opiates. It, it's a much more, we've actually had Dr. Conti, the head of the lab, train officers on how to do it the way a lab technician would do it. Huh. You know, with gloves, gloves and appropriate, right, uh, right. appropriate protective gear. And that's really just a field test to see whether it's, you know, it, it tests presumptively for, um, for heroin or whatever drug you're, you're wow. testing for. So it, it is a, fentanyl is an extremely dangerous drug. And the other thing I'd say is, you know, Tony is modest on what they've, you know, what police officers are required to do now, and and it is remarkable how it's changed over, right. you know, my career in law enforcement, where uh, we are we're asking a tremendous amount of, of our police officers right now. Um, they are not only enforcing the law; that's probably a very small part of what they're doing right now. Yeah. Um, they're doing, you know, they're they're doing rescues, they're doing uh, outreach for treatment, they're doing they're almost quasi-social workers now. It's just a tremendous amount that we're having our uh, right. the police do. Well, I, they've been encouraging most everybody to walk, to have Narcan. Uh, my husband just had surgery, um, and because they gave him opioids, they, mm -hmm. we, we, were, we had, had uh, Narcan at home, and they showed us how to, how to use it. And I was just surprised at that. But I, yeah. uh, but I guess someday, God yeah, forbid, you'd you know, be the, the, the state police has been carrying it now for yeah. a while. I think uh, the a large majority of law enforcement in the state wow. carry it now. Okay. Not all, but for so the has things changed down at the academy then too. I'm sure there's been a lot of um, shift in, in focus down at the academy. Sure, we're training. You know, our th our trainings change. Uh, they monitor. I mean, that's not that's the criminal justice training council, right. but they're right. they're fully on top of, yeah. of what the training protocol should be for in, in all of these areas. I'm sure but, in the uh, correction office. I've got to have somebody in from corrections to talk about that. Mm -hmm. That must be another whole show. Yeah. So and I know that there's, we've had um, places where people can drop their their syringes. That we even had drug drug drop offs, and that's yes. that's you've got it here in town, right? Yes. Um, and has that been successful all over Vermont? Do you know? Maybe it, it's the been heavily. It's been uh, greatly uh, um, successful right. and well received. Uh, the DEA um, hosts uh, periodically uh, drug take back days. We publicize yes. that through our prevention and outreach partners uh, in, in my area here, Mont Montpelier. It's Central Vermont New Directions Coalition, and uh, it's just really important um, to, to get rid of the meds because for right. a variety of reasons, if they're expired, I mean, it, it's just. They don't need to be sitting in somebody's cabinet, right. and especially when we're talking about um, narcotics that have a very high street value yep. um, and can also you know, increase the risk of victimization Robbery. for yeah. people to be burglarized yeah. or robbed if, if it's known that they have these drugs yeah. just sitting sitting there. It's um, good not to flush it down the old toilet either from yes, the environment. Is, just sit <laughs> um, It's not good in the water. Yes, and I'll, the other thing too is our um, you know just having a, a, a needle disposal boxes right. Montpelier. Uh, uh, this year, we we made sure they're in all of our city uh, city f buildings and facilities, from city right, hall, police department, fire department. And do people use them? Department. I mean, they Labs. yes, they do. Really? Yep. And it's obviously once they you, you don't approach them, they're using them, and you don't want to. Yeah, we no, just want to make sure no they're fear they're, of being arrested or questioned. <coughs> or anything. Correct. Yeah. And uh, and it can be also for legitimate purposes too. Uh, you know what we're trying to make sure does not happen. Uh, you know, we get calls all the time. Every police department does. Hey, there's some needles in a park, right, or right. you know, so where are they being discarded? And so that's really what we're trying to to stop by having yep. these readily available. Is that they're right. safe, they're they're handled by our fire department. They're, they're the ones that go around and collect them, and then they're properly disposed of exactly. as as hazardous material sharps. Yep. And you said that you, you said um, you should ask how many syringes are given out every year. When well, do, where two, do we do that? Uh, so we have syringe. They're called syringe exchanges. They're given out at a lot of the uh, Department of Health, uh, Howard Center in Burlington. Oh. There are a number of places around the state that they are they are provided uh, for free. So, the, so the two issues: the drug take back day has been a huge success. Yep, right. There's um, lines of people. Yeah, I've I mean, seen. You know, we are in the process of putting drug disposal. Uh, boxes in all of the barracks, so it make it more convenient for people to drop off their drugs. Uh, Sheriff Marcoux in Lamoille County has been really uh, a superstar in that area. 
He's been the one kind of coordinating the pickup of all the drugs because it's just not as easy as collecting them. You then have to collect them. You've got to get them to DEA so they can be destroyed appropriately. Right. Um, and so he, Roger Marcou, Sheriff Marcou has done really yeoman's work on coordinating the pickup of all these drugs and getting them to DEA him. Uh, quickly. So that's been a huge success, and DEA is a tremendous partner in that. And just while I'm thinking about it, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, Tony touched on the, the, the level of cooperation that goes on with law enforcement in the state. And, you know, I've been, I, you know, I was a U.S. attorney in Vermont. I was a U.S. attorney in a number of, uh, you know, I worked in a number of offices around the country, and uh, that doesn't happen by accident. Hmm. It takes a lot of work on behalf of, of chiefs and uh, sheriffs hmm. and uh, federal law enforcement and state law enforcement to, to make sure we're, we're leveraging our, our resources as best we can. Now, on the syringe issue, we give out about a million syringes a year in the state. Whoa. So I think the last numbers I saw in for 2015, which I don't have a reason to believe has changed, uh, were a little shy of a million needles, uh, needle syringes we gave out, we gave out each year. And... The idea of having the boxes or, or to collect them, I'm not sure we have a, a good way to collect all of those, all of those right. back. Well, I know. Um, I did Green Up Day when I was in the Department of Transportation about out in 89, and we all had this box of, to keep hazardous material. I was, I was blown away by what we were picking up, and the minute you looked like you saw something, all these people came swooping in to tell you not to touch it and to put it in the box right on mm -hmm. 89. Just right out the window. It's like great. Yeah. So I heard you talk at a, an event we were at about uh, your concern about heroin and marijuana for uh, safe driving and driving impaired. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because marijuana takes effect July 1st. Correct. So we'll, uh, marijuana will be legalized in right. Vermont uh, on July 1st. I think if you, if um, the states that have already have it legalized and mostly, I think the best evidence and what uh, the best data is coming out of Colorado and Washington State that if Vermont follows in, it follows that pattern that we can expect a higher rate of fatalities on our highways wow. once uh, once marijuana is legalized and that was sort of one of the one of the reasons we were pushing for the uh, the, the, the oral fluid the testing to test, try right. to have a better mechanism for detecting right. and prosecuting those that are so irresponsible that they you know they get high uh, and get out get out on the roadways so right. That was one of the main reasons we were, we were arguing for that. I think Governor Scott has made clear that he's not going to consider um, any any further marijuana legislation unless we address this roadway safety. Yeah. Um, well, sadly, so. something's going to have to happen <coughs> for the Senate to say, "Gee, maybe maybe we were wrong," yeah, and that's so. going to require a few, mm -hmm. sadly, a few accidents out there. Which well, I mean, they, they are they are pushing for the full tax and regulate, right. and uh, the governor's made clear that that's well, you know that that. that Addressing this roadway safety is, right. is a prerequisite to before yeah. he's going to consider that. Because so. you need a test. Because I was thinking, a couple of <coughs> the DREs <coughs> take you through quite a process, and mm -hmm. it could last more than an hour or so, whether in the barracks or out on the road. And I can just see people being really excited about that. So you need something that's fairly quick. You tell right. the person, you know, you're under the influence. Here's your ticket. See you. Right. Um, or, you know, they can't drive home. There's also another challenge with the DREs, and I've had this conversation with Lieutenant Flanagan from the Vermont State Police. Uh, for the smaller agencies, like, you know, we are in Washington County, we, have, we definitely have a need for more DREs mm. um, because there's just not enough to go around. Right. At the same time, the, the investment and the training, uh, for example, for Montpelier to, uh, to train uh, a DRE, but it's kind of like having a canine. Too, because once we have that that right, officer right. trained up, um, I mean, and as you just you, know, you just mentioned, they could be, you know, out of the area for some time if they're assisting yeah. another another right. agency. <laughs> then you have to wait um, on top of everything. Yeah. So uh, so unless it's balanced, yeah. um, it, it can be a real uh, uh, you know real burden for uh, smaller local agencies. Um, can any of your men go through the training and, and be qualified as a DRE, or will that take them away from what? You've got to do on a on a regular basis. Well, we, you know, we're certainly considering it. Um, you know, our officers. Uh, it's um, it's what we're going to have to. Yeah, I mean, right. I, I know that I, I believe that's that's inevitable. Um, it's just, uh, and, I, and I can't remember how long it takes to train them because they they go out of state for right. a part, oh, really? part of the oh, training. Oh, really? Oh, this is expensive too. I'm it's, sure. Uh, so. 
Well, we've had trainings yeah. in state. Some of them, yeah. some of them are out of state. For but, some uh, reason, forty-five is the number that's in my head, and I have no idea what where that came from. But I think that's what we have. You know, I know we've had robust classes the last time, the last time we've done it. I know we're getting better. And the idea is that you know you spread out, you sp you get enough of these that it's a, it's a, right. it's a, it gets to be less of a burden right. on right. the agencies that are doing it because we've right. got so many of them. But uh, they're critically important in these cases because. They right now they're they're kind of the only evidence we have that the person was right. under the influence of some of some drug and again it's an expert opinion which is yep. subject to smart defense attorneys. I was going to say it's um, he said she said almost. Well, so, you know, it, uh, it but I think with all the training, they the it would weigh on their side. Yeah. I would hope. What's well, the yeah, point? I mean, there's, there's a step before that too. Without you know, with um, you know, with a with the, what's called a ride training, which is an advanced recognition training that the officers you know that all of our, our officers yeah. have We're trying to get, make sure all of our folks have that training. Because a good, you still have to do a good investigation from that right. from that stop or right. that that interaction with the uh, the suspected impaired driver. So there's a lot that's already, you know, kind of building the stage, the foundation, if you will. So when that DRE does arrive, you know, he or she will can look at what do you have so far for evidence, admissions, um, what have you seen from, you know, what was the operation like. Right. So all oh, those factors, right. just like in any any um, uh, traditional alcohol-based DUI, yep. they're still critical. Um, and it's not like the DRE just comes in cold and just starts from scratch. Right. Right. You know, the police officers, the troopers, the sheriffs still have to do uh, a really a good, solid job on good. learning as much as they can about why they believe this individual is impaired. So at what point can you help these people? I mean, um, if they are addicted, at what point can you hopefully interject and give them some suggestions or bring them somewhere where they can get help? Because that's the key. They've got mm -hmm. to get the help. And if they refuse it, um, they'll be right back on the road right. and doing their thing. So how, how, what do you do? Do they have to be in custody for you to get them that help? Or can you no. uh, well, encourage us, them on the road or something? No, um, it's kind of course dusting off the old DEA demand reduction model from yep. the 90s. Uh, they, they realize, you know, how, how we, you know, whether it's a large corporation like IBM, you know, you have, if the, you don't just terminate the employee because they have a cocaine addiction. Um, you know, you've invested tens of thousands of dollars right. in that person, right. you know, and, and, you know, whereas the person at the time may have, uh, you know, from another company may have, you know, alcoholism, okay, they might be treated, but if it's, if it's illegal drugs and, and so forth. So there's a, a lot learned because the United States is still the number one country of, for demand to be high, you know, whatever really? the substance. Yeah, that was just, I don't think that statistic, so much, you would think why? I don't think that statistic <laughs> has changed from back Whoa. then. We, uh, we lead the world in the consumption of uh, uh, oxycotton and hydrocodone. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, you by told by me a that. very large, <laughs> by a wide margin. Right. Really? I think we. I. I, I, I want to say we consume maybe 80 percent of the, of the. It's uh, because of our need the, to be high. Uh, yeah, I mean so. it's a. Um, and we have the money to buy it. Probably some other countries that people don't have the. It, it, yeah. It's the a money. huge percentage what? of the worldwide. Uh, Prescription opioids wow. that are consumed by in the United States. Oh it's a, it's a, it's a, You're depressing me, Commissioner. So, <laughs> so back to your question, though, is what can law enforcement do to, yeah. uh, to help facilitate people in treatment? Um, several years ago, around 2015 or so, uh, City Manager Bill Frazier uh, gave me uh, um, a little article, uh, something, and it was on, hey, what do you think of this? And it was um, something that Chief Leonard Campanella was doing in Gloucester, Massachusetts that was, you know, totally radically different uh, and that was instead of keeping arrest you know keep arresting the right. you know people addicts for possession um, he said this is just this is crazy he was able to start um, having the officers um, get them to treatment the department and uh, and it really kind of started taking off and what he basically started was what's called PARI or the police addictive addiction recovery initiative and so I looked at that and I'm like huh and at that time, um, you know, Eric Miller was a U.S. was our U.S. attorney yep. and governor and Governor Shumlin, and everything we always saw on press conferences with you know, and also with with uh, T.J. Donovan and usually in Cheney County yeah, right. at the time, right. um, you know, was like treatment was six months out, and that was just drilled into the publics because at all the big press conferences right. and with the colonel, that's what we kept seeing, and so I assumed that was the same situation on the ground here in Montpelier in, in Washington County. And then I met uh, Deborah Hopkins from Central oh, Mont yes. Substance yep. Abuse Services, She's great. and and uh, and our our city council said, "Hey, we want to we want an update from the chief. What's going on with this? We're, you know, with the, with heroin problem." And and Deborah told me, "says We have capacity here." And I go, "What? What does that mean? Like, how many people do you have in treatment right now? 
and, and you have capacity, okay. So I talked to folks in uh, the Vermont Drug Task Force right. and, and on the federal side uh, saying, what do addicts, you know, and, and they were like, they don't even try to get help, you know, when they fed, it, they said, because the word was there's no help out there. So looking at what Chief Campanello had started in Gloucester and um, talked to a colleague of mine from, uh, from the FBI National Academy, he's the Deputy Chief on Scarborough, Maine, uh, Dave Grover, and we're like, and he started, they started doing something very similar mm -hmm with their existing resources. So it wasn't the same model as Gloucester. And so we're like, huh, well, we have the Lighthouse, which is a, a program, it's our public inebriate bed here right. in Washington County, and it's run by Washington County Mental Health, another very strong partner um, for us here in right. law enforcement. So we just started saying, could we do something like that here? And um, so then we had the, uh, we brought in the state's attorney, and uh, um, I even kind of had a conversation, and, when, and we had, when we launched a heroin forum, um, you know, that, that winter, um, you know, Eric Miller was, was there, and, and, and we had Dr. Javad Mishkari, another one of our partners from the, the emergency department at the right, medical right. center. And um, so, we come, so we launched Project Safe Catch, and it was our version of, of the PARI model. And there was, uh, you know, so we started off as kind of the pilot with Montpelier, and then it kind of went to Berry City, because I had regular communication with Tim right. Bombardier, yeah. uh, and the Middlesex Station commander at the time, Lieutenant Matt Nally. And eventually, um, it's now countywide with all the law enforcement signing on. And what it means is, is that if anybody flags down or initiates contact with law enforcement now in Washington County, doesn't matter what color the cruiser is, um, say, I need, I need help, or goes to the lobby of the police station, uh, okay, yeah, well, if you have any narcotics or paraphernalia, there's, there's that drug box we were right. just talking about. Right. And then we'll introduce them. And we'll either, if it's during hours, we will bring them right to, to the hub up in Berlin. If it's after hours, that's where the lighthouse comes in. And that was the key. You know, what do you do at 2 o'clock in the morning when right. somebody is at, whatever at that right. point, you've got to be where they're at to help, you know, transition them into treatment. And if they're, you know, while they're willing. And it it's not, might not last. You might have to do this yeah. five times if they're willing. Um, so the lighthouse is now a model where we could bring them. And they've changed their, what, how they're uh, set up and staffed that they could help have you know, that person at least supported until the hub opens up because right. my goal as a police chief was a couple was twofold. One, you know, in somebody's, if somebody's desperate, you know, before they go grab a gun and, and go you know, hold up the local convenience right. store because they need to score, you know, their next bundle of heroin, um, you know, there's another alternative where they're not going to just be alone, and and, and right. we can get them start getting them help, and, and it's um, so. Is that part of the methadone? Because we have two drug treatment centers in. Berlin. We have the methadone, and then we have the one by the hospital. Which well, there's the hub and spoke uh, model. Which is, yeah, that's um, the right. thing that, 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 that really, really has we've been gotten a, a lot of success. attention mm -hmm. for that, haven't we? <clears throat> yeah, that's been statewide. Uh, it's yeah. really a model the, the rest of the country is looking at, and the idea is you have these hub and spokes that are really uh, allowing people to get treatment uh, right. virtually on demand. I mean, the 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 wait uh, times that uh, Tony talked about earlier, they've basically virtually been eliminated in the state. So, right. uh, you know, I, I think a, a person that's addicted to opioids, if they want treatment, right. they can get This treatment. is all voluntary, it sounds like. They have Absolutely. to come in and say, right. Right. help right. me, right? Because, I mean, there's um, not, all of, not all of the opioid addicted people want to be in treatment. Mm -hmm. they, they like their addiction. They are dedicated to their addiction. But the people that want treatment, um, it's available. It's, yep. it's now available in Vermont. Right. So. And right. Another interesting piece of that too is, you know, there, there is that there was a little uh, that that very very limited amnesty, if you will. Again, if they self-initiate, um, it's not our intent to charge them with possession. Right. Uh, you right. know, again, just get rid of it, um, and we want to get them to the help. The other time we have used it successfully also is there's been a, um, um, you know, whether we we arrested somebody for a, you know for burglary before, and they were a very heavy user. Uh, a couple of bur actually a couple of burglary related cases um, they they're still held accountable uh, as a matter of fact one of those uh, individuals um, you know went through a successfully uh, treatment court so they still they were held accountable for their criminal actions and then we still said by the way mm. 
there's this. Right. You need help. Can we help? How do we? And, and, you know, so. Even if they've been accused of a crime because they, they still have to volunteer to get help for the addiction? Or yes. Can you and make unless, them unless go? It's court, you know, unless the court's court can order as a condition oh, of probation, yeah, it, you know, that they, right. they attend treatment. But Probably I mean, if their mindset right. isn't to get treatment, you it wouldn't work. You have to want to be in treatment for right. treatment to be right. successful. It's yes. like bringing out, you can take a horse to water, but you yes. can't make them drink. <laughs> because I bet that's not an easy treatment to go through either, the the withdrawal and all the stuff. No, there's, there's, a, there's a physical illness to yeah, it. Uh, right. if, if you're just doing a withdrawing cold turkey, right. there's a physical illness to it. Could you tell a little bit, because we have a, a few minutes left, yeah. but I wanted to talk about um, the prescription drugs. And I've heard you talk about this before. And I, um, and that you say that is the main problem. Yeah, I, to me, it, the, the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, I think the CDC has said the same thing. I think the uh, President's Commission has said the same thing, that what got us in this problem was the overprescribing of, of opioids. Um, and, you know, I think, I mean, the doctors and the, pharm the pharmaceutical companies, um, it was just a 10 year or 15 year period, they were just completely overprescribed. Right. Where, you know, initially, you know, the 80% of the people that were, that were showing up as uh, heroin addicted started on pain pills. That oh. was the, uh, and I initially did not believe that statistic. But the more I looked at it, the more I researched right. it, it really is, it is correct that, um, and so what happened was they started to, you know, we did a better job on the diversion of, of legal opioids that, that when you have these people that are addicted, then they're turning to the street, the street drug, right. heroin, now it's fentanyl. And I think in 10 years, we're only going to see fentanyl. Um, and that's sort of what, what got us into this problem. So to me, the first step is bending that curve. Like I'll give you an example. In 2015, Vermont issued 600 prescriptions, 600,000 prescriptions oh. in the state for opioids. About half of the prescriptions issued in this state in 2015 were for opioids. So think about that. That's blood pressure medicine. Wow, good grief. Uh, you know, it's, it's antibiotics, whatever you need with a prescription. Right. Half of the ones written in 2015 were for opioids. Wow. That's 600,000. There's only 623,000 people in the state, so it's right. almost one for everybody. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, with, the, with the, uh, the drug, the prescription monitoring system that we put in place in Vermont, that that uh, and the education that doctors are yep, getting right. that I that they're, I'm they're oh, getting it. We are seeing some some bending of that curve because they have to write out a hard uh, a prescription every month uh, or whenever the drugs you have to go physically and get a hard copy uh, prescription. So that they should be looking at you then. And we're also right? they have to put it into a database now yeah, for the right. state. Oh. So you know I do think we're starting to bend the curve on the number of prescriptions right. that are being issued. The last data I saw from the health department were, was encouraging. And so I look at it as, you know, this is, there's a supply and demand of this, uh, you know, there's a de and that's how we're going to conquer this thing. And a lot of the supply or the, the number of people that needed treatment were coming in because they were, got addicted to on, on pills right. or they got them illegally or they were diverted. So we don't have a, pills. do we have a problem with drugs coming into the state illegally? I mean, there must be, uh, that must be a component too. Yeah, absolutely. What are so, we doing about that? You know, I don't want, uh, you know, I don't want you to think that the prescriptions, we've done a pretty good job on stopping the diversion of illegal, of, of prescription opioids. Right. Uh, the, what happens is that people that were addicted, they may have been using pills to feed their addiction. Once they can't get those, then they're going to the cheaper, oh, okay. the more available street drug, which is the fentanyl and the heroin, which, are, which is, you know, our source cities are still Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts. Oh, um, just that those were, So that, those are sort of Holyoke. Those are still sort of oh. our New York City. Those are sort of our, our source yep. our source cities. So no, we do we have a robust uh, supply chain of illegal drugs that are coming into the state, and that's really where the drug task forces come in, mm -hmm. and um, you know that they've had the ability both with DEA and the Vermont Drug Task Force, which has four different units in the four quadrants of the state that are doing the longer term uh, drug investigations. And you have to understand, drug investigations take a long time because you know you're always you're always starting sort of at the lowest level. Uh, user or distributor and you're trying to work your way up the chain and those are they're just painstaking investigations right. and the other thing you don't see is is that oftentimes we'll develop information that is helpful to Springfield Massachusetts or the state police in Massachusetts or in New Hampshire and then they are disrupting a supply chain in that state right. which affects which which favorably affects right. us because they right. have taken out in Massachusetts or in, in New Hampshire someone that has been bringing up drugs um, to our state so right. So it must be in everything, though. Trucks, airplanes, I mean, trains, planes, and 
Well, uh, yeah, it's everywhere, it's, right? And that's why I think back to you know demand reduction or taking you know getting right. people you know into treatment because they're going to unless they're they're treated if they're an addict dealer right. they're going to continue to deal right. if they're an addict turn burglar to robber because sometimes they do escalate in the types of crimes that they'll yeah. commit um, you know then then we're not going to change that I mean it, right. but back to a positive note all of this coordination with um, our medical medical partners now and I you know right. I, I now go to, to a a meeting once a month now with a bunch of doctors and treatment oh, providers. Uh, and again, the, the job has changed, um, but but back to that and, and things like Project Safe Catch and also recent, most recently now is we're doing a follow-up. I have my officers. We, you know, after a, a serious overdose that you know with with the police and the ambulance responded to uh, in a couple of days. You know, after that you know reversal, yeah. um, just touch base because that person may or may not be receptive. But here's a card to the hub. Right. You know, and do you need any help? Because that you know, in the moment so when they come, so each county must have a hub, or, uh, or, yeah. or, or a spoke, yeah. or, or a spoke, or a spoke yeah. you know, right. where the hub is sort of the main thing, and then yeah. the right. spokes going out, so that it covers right. covers all. And the, we all have the enough beds uh, every night for well, these the, folks. They're not. Need most of these are not residential treatment programs. These are out oh. treatment, medically assisted treatment programs ah. to keep people functioning. Oh. Um, yeah, and uh, so it's it's not like because I remember years ago you and I and the Tim Bombardier, Chief Bombardier, we were working with Mary Moulton on when when some of these folks would go to the hospitals mm -hmm. and they'd wake up and cause all kinds of trouble and we there wasn't any place to bring them right and uh, that was a big issue. Well, yeah, I mean, there's now the state the the, the psychiatric hospital now in Berlin right. since then. But the other thing is from a crime, you know, back to what my job, primary job is to this, you know, to the sins of Montpelier, is is how am I best controlling crime and the, the coordination of everything, Safe Catch, uh, working closely with the Drug Task Force and our federal partners and, and local partners. Uh, crime last year, our burglary was unprecedented. We were down 50% in burglary. Good. Our total crime was down 14%. Um, you know, and I've had conversations with the Intelligence Center, what's, right. what's different, you know, and, and it's not just one thing. Uh, so we're hoping that that trend, and that's why, so when I started off early, I said, you know, when a small community like Montpelier, sometimes, you know, it's easier for us to correct course because we can see what's working or what's not working more quickly yeah. than, you know, trying to get, you know, balance all different challenges at a state level or even beyond. Do you go over to the high schools or schools with your officers and, and talk to the kids in college? Because I have a feeling you must visit the high schools on occasion, too. And I, well, we have a full-time yeah. school resource officer, oh, that's right. so he's, that's right. yeah, definitely he's there. definitely in tune to everything that we're doing. And that's yeah. uh, one, of the, one of the things we are actually evaluating the lieutenants and all the barracks are, or their outreach to the communities, right. including schools. The one thing I did want to get back to that, that Tony said was the supply and demand. Um, if you, you know, simple things for simple minds. I look at that, there's a, there's a supply side of this, and we're on the supply side of this. We're trying to stop the supply. And, but it, all, the ultimate solution to this, and police officers get the this, demand. is the demand. Right. So you have, if you can stop the people, and on the demand side of that is treatment. So you're trying to get people to stop using, so it reduces the demand there. Right. Uh, we're trying to reduce the number of prescription opioids that get people addicted in the first place um, and try to reduce the, reduce the demand. So if we could pinch that, the number of people coming in that need treatment, uh, ultimately that will, that will be the solution. And, you know, the doctors are smart people. They get it. And they've been, uh, you know, they, they are um, working hard, I think, with everyone to try to reduce the number of prescriptions that are being issued for, uh, for opioids. They're being much more careful that people don't get uh, addicted based on the fact that they're getting 30 or 60 day supply of, right. of opioids right. when it doesn't take that and long to get addicted I to I was going to say, you never know personally whether you're the one who's going to get addicted in couple of days or a couple right. of weeks, right? I mean, everybody's sort of different. Right. Plus, you always heard those stories, too, you know, when go around uh, showing a movie called The, you know, the Opiate Effect, and we had a presenter. People out in the public would always, the adults would talk about, hey, I had this procedure, and I got, you know, X number of pills. Yeah, right. And um, I know from my own, you know, rebuilt knee, right. it's like nobody ever, you know, the, how was the knee surgery? Right. No one asked you. How was the pain management? Did you have enough? Right, you right. Just keep you know. giving it to you. And, and that's something yeah. that's really starting to change. Yeah. Uh, and I give the medical community a lot of credit for acknowledging yeah. that. Sometimes there's correcting. nothing wrong with ibuprofen. I mean, just the, the one you that know, blew me right. away were, were the, the, the number of dentists that were giving it out for wisdom mm. teeth. Or oh, was, really? Was, yeah, that was the one that kind of blew me away. That oh, it was, no, I was at, we had an opiate uh, summit here in Montpelier a couple years ago, and I can't remember the doctor's name from from from, from Fletcher Allen. Uh, Emergency department, but he he said basically this, you know, outside of the United States, you know, again back to how we doctors are evaluated in medical right. facilities. And when you break your leg, 
It hurts. It's supposed to hurt. <laughs> no, exactly. And I just, that quote really, exactly. really stays with well, me. Well, that's when I went back to that zero to 10. <clears throat> You're not supposed to be at zero. You yeah, just right. had major yeah. surgery. Give me a break. Yeah. You know, it's not going to last forever. But, but manage it. Yeah. Man yeah, but you don't have to, it doesn't have to be zero. Right. You know, um, uh, Chief, you mentioned before and, and um, about the drug treatment courts. Um, we have them all over the state, I'm assuming. Uh, do they really help? Um, and uh, I don't have a lot of experience at, at the state level. I do it at the federal level. And, uh, you know, they can be extremely effective. Um, and I've always, I've always thought that they're, they are effective, um, you know, and it really relies on the judge that is heading up the drug court. Yeah. Um, and the effectiveness of those, in my experience, and again, this is at the federal level, was if you had a, had a judge really committed to it, um, they, they could be really, really beneficial. Yeah. Um, and they assign treatment, or they would say, "Do you go to such and such a place to get treated, or what is their what is their scope of?" of so I, I don't, I'm control. not control. Yeah, I'm not even. I'm not that familiar with the oh, state program. The, yeah. the federal program was they were generally involved with people that were coming out of prison. Oh, okay. And so they yep. were, you know, you would be able to, you know, they and a lot of these people would be on supervised release, which is yeah. sort of like parole in yeah. the federal well, system. Well, we have that here in Barry, and I bet you have it here too, where groups of people support. A prisoner coming out of uh, coming out of uh, yeah, the code circle of support yes, accountability. Yes, and they would watch teams. them and help them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm assuming uh, that there must be some kind of support, peer support for for addicts as well. Is there not? Yeah, I mean We're, that's that's uh, anybody that is involved in the recovery of, right. of addiction, uh, being connected and uh, and and also breaking certain you know bonds that you had right. that would oh yeah don't you know like certain friends. groups of people. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Right. You know, to make sure that um, they have all the support that they need to, and that you know, people care about that. Somebody cares about them, right? Uh, that they're accountable. You know, hey, what did you do today? Right. Um, and that's kind of, uh, and I know with our drug courts here, the at the local level, and I, I don't have any statistical information, but they're really designed for the the real serious addict, not just the you know the one time person. Yeah. Um, but it, there's a lot of controls to make sure that uh, kind of like the COSA team. Yeah, the, um, that's it, COSA. But there's a lot of accountability there. Yeah. So. Well, Commissioner, we were going to have uh, uh, Lieutenant Teresa Randall, who's the head of the Vermont Drug Task Force, join us, but she was she, called away. She got called away yes. on But uh, what business. is that about? That's under your purview about the... The Drug Task yeah. Forces? Yeah, so the, uh, the Vermont Drug Task Forces have been in, boy, they've been in, uh, uh, they've been working in the state now for a long time, back when I was a line assistant U.S. attorney, I, when I worked for a living. <laughs> um, so they were, uh, they're really, the state police does that really well. Senator Leahy's been a tremendous supporter yeah. of the... Uh, of the Vermont Drug well, Task Force. He's been forces. good for Vermont. We had to give him a yeah, and we do try to get in, you know, <clears throat> try to target the higher level distributors within an area. Uh, we've had, you know, some great success. Sometimes you see about the drug sweeps. We did a big one up in Newport last year, uh, but even in Barry, in Rutland. Um, so they work in the four quadrants of the state. And what they're really trying to do is work with the local, uh, the local law enforcement federal law enforcement to identify the highest level traffickers in the state. Right. Uh, but as I said, those investigations can be very, very painstaking yeah. and they can take a long time. Huh. Um, so you're, you're obviously trying to work your way up the supply chain to get the, you know, find out who the person in Vermont is that's, that really is, has the distribution network, uh, who is your out of state source of supply, and maybe that's when the feds, you know, the, the federal authorities would get interested. And you're really trying to take out that whole supply chain right. uh, in a, in a large-scale investigation. So, what's next for the council and for law enforcement here locally? I mean, just keep doing more of the same, or I, you know, I, I think we're fortunate in Vermont because I think on the law enforcement end, and Tony, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we do it pretty well. Uh, we, have we have good success. Good we have you just good don't success. have enough of us. Though. Yeah, we have a good success in our investigations. Um, I do think I used to like to say when I was U.S. Attorney. I mean, Vermont's small enough that. You know, when you put together a, a pretty good case or a large case, you're really making a dent in things. Right. Versus if you're in a big city, you're just like, you know, you really, how much difference are you making? Right. So, but, you know, the, what well, I'd emphasize. You can see it here, right? I mean, you, can, you, you can see it. Uh, you can see it. And um, the, the one thing I, I like to say is, you know, the law enforcement does get it. This is about demand reduction. Um, again, I go back to my Ebola uh, analogy. Right. If we had, you know, an Ebola breakout and we had, we had 100, you know, we had, a bunch of people that had Ebola, we'd be treating them. Right, you but have be, a lot be, of staff. Yeah, but we'd be <laughs> damn sure we were trying to figure right. out stopping it, people from getting infected. Right. That would right. be the other end of this. And so I look at that as like, you know, stopping people from getting addicted to this in the first place is really, really critical. Well, well is there anything else? We just have about a minute left that uh, we haven't covered that you'd like to cover, Commissioner? Or? 
Uh, um, Chief? Not unless Chief, okay? Chief does. I think. Uh, yeah. You guys you have know. done a great job, and I think uh, Jalinda was very, uh, when she's talking about it, I think she's energized, the governor's energized, that, that we'll get this done somehow. Yeah, the one thing I, I might say, if I've got a minute, yep. is, you know, we've been piloting a program up in, up in the St. Albans Barrack, where we've actually embedded sort of a mental health social worker with the troopers up there. Oh, I read about that. So that's, a that's been a huge, I mean, um, the lieutenant that's up there right now, he's about an 18-year veteran of the, of the state police who runs the barracks. I mean, his statement to me when I was asking about it was he goes, this is the most successful thing oh, that I have seen in my 18 years as great. a police officer. So we we're trying to expand that to try to get them uh, in all of the barracks. But that would be sort of an embedded person Excellent. that can work with addicted individuals, great. mental health, because there's often a, a lot of overlap between addiction and mental health, and try to get them into the treatment program uh, that works best for them. So now that's been hugely successful. You've done a little bit of that in Team 2. We had a show about that where you work with mental health people yeah. when you go on the scene with somebody. But resources, you know, if, in a perfect world, we would do exactly right. what you're doing up right. in St. Albans. Right. Um, you know, and in other, other jurisdictions, uh, there's just so few and far between you know, where we do have social embedded social yeah, workers. Because I bet Montclair they would, would let you look at one. things a little differently because they could step oh, back sure. and, yeah. and give you a different insight than perhaps you would see with, um, you know, with that law enforcement focus. Right, because, I mean, mental, mental illness is, you know, it's the whole thing with Team 2, I don't get too off topic, but when somebody's in crisis, right. you know, law enforcement should only be there for the safety part of it. Yep. Um, right. You know, really it's about getting that person to the right level of care oh. when they need it, and, and, and we're not the clinicians. Yeah. You have both been doing a fabulous job. Thank you for being Thank on the show. Thank you for having us. It's been great Thank being you here. very much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, as Jolinda said, this is one of a series of eight uh, shows on, on educating you on the, the situation here in Vermont on the opioid crisis. So hope you've learned some things and stay tuned for the other shows. Mm -hmm.